Welcome back to Master the Marketplace with Caspian. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Master the Marketplace with Caspian. We have a special guest with us today, Chris McCabe, founder and CEO of e-commerce. Chris, he is an expert in everything suspended listings on Amazon and I'm super excited to talk to him today. Recently, I got to know Chris. I also attended his Seller Velocity Conference. It was just a fantastic event. And so he's probably going to tell us a little bit about that as well. But Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, suspended listings, suspended accounts. Hopefully in Q4, people aren't dealing with either. But when they do, they uh, typically call us sooner than later just because they're losing so much revenue in Q4 versus the rest of the year. But yeah, thanks for having me. No, uh, we appreciate you taking the time today. So, so Chris, just to get started on today's conversation, before we even get into suspended listings or, yeah. or accounts, let's just talk about you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and then a little bit about e-commerce, Chris, as well. Yeah, so we started e-commerce, Chris, seven years ago, uh, a little bit after I left Amazon. I took a year off when I left Amazon to pursue other things, um, moved, moved from Seattle back to Boston, which is where I'm from. Um, and over the years, consulted sellers about more and more things. Uh, we're definitely not one-stop shopping for everything Amazon, but when it comes to reinstatement appeals or protecting an account from an attack from a competitor, protecting an account from Amazon insanity, I guess you'd call it, or just composing the right kinds of appeals to get reinstated quicker, uh, most people come to us hopefully early in the process. I, I worked on the teams at Amazon, collectively known as seller performance, but the teams that enforce policies, suspended accounts, the teams that read appeals to decide if they'd be accepted or not for reinstatement. So the consulting I do now is an equivalent of what I used to do for Amazon. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. So Excellent. Um, and yeah. then Chris, what got you into Amazon, into that particular team as well? What was your history before that? And you know, tell us a little bit about just your background. Yeah, I started as a fraud investigator, which is not so much what we're focused on now. We're more kind of the, you know, regulation of performance of a seller account and reviewing seller accounts and seller listings. When I started at Amazon, I was hired to prevent buyer fraud, seller fraud, marketplace fraud in all of its forms. Um, later we got into the, you know, answering emails from sellers. The marketplace was a lot smaller back then. We're talking about the, I guess, early 2000s, mid 2000s. So long time ago that I began working there, but I had a good bird's eye view of the evolution of the marketplace into what it is today, which is a lot bigger and a lot harder to manage. Um, and of course, if Amazon did a better job of managing the marketplace, I wouldn't have to step in as often as I do now. But most of our clients are brands who need that navigation and strategy and troubleshooting sooner than later because so much money is on the line when things happen that you know, limit your ability, restrict your ability to sell the way you normally would. So I began as a fraud investigator um, that evolved into the, you know, seller coaching and, and seller appeal strategy that we have today. Great. And Chris, mm -hmm. I know I was fortunate enough, fortunate enough to be part of the seller velocity conference this year, but tell us a little more about the conference. You know, how often do you hold it? What's the goal of mm -hmm. the conference and how that relates to the work that you do with e-commerce, Chris? Yeah, and by the way, thanks for participating. I know the Seattle to Boston flight isn't easy for everybody, but I'm glad you came in for the event in Boston this year. Um, Seller Velocity Conference is, I guess we've had three versions of it now. Uh, we've tried different cities, different formats. It's not always the same thing in the same place. Um, that could change as, as we find formats that we love. This year was particularly good. And we had a great speaker lineup this year. Uh, the intention of the conference is to get Amazon brands and just growing e-commerce businesses paired up with as many of the best minds in the business as possible. So whether that's Amazon focused or we, you're our omni-channel expert, right? So we were really happy to have you there. Um, we got a lot of great feedback about you as a speaker from some of our attendees. And um, we've had phenomenal feedback from this year in particular, just because of the strength of the speaker lineup and also the engagement that the attendees had with the speakers, whether it was after a talk or during networking or even the, the VIP dinner we had afterwards. So we, we definitely plan on doing at least at least one seller velocity event in 2022 and, and presumably a seller velocity conference. Yeah. 
Fantastic. And I know, you know, besides obviously being part of the, the, the speaking lineup, I really got a chance to interact with a lot of sellers in a very intimate like setting, which you don't really get in a number of other conferences, both at the dinner as well as in person, and then blended that with the more online version as well. I think all that yeah. just came together really well for me personally. So that, that was really great to see. Yeah. And we've, I don't know if we've pioneered this strategy, but we're definitely developing an online portal or platform where people can engage with speakers and sponsors before an event. Um, if they're virtual ticket holders during the event, asking questions and then after the event as well, of course, follow up post conference. So we're trying to expand that for next year and make it a longer tail engagement. Um, so yeah. Excellent. We're looking forward Excellent. to it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, Chris, you know, I wanted to get a little into listing and account suspensions, but more importantly, let's talk a little more about maybe just trends that we are seeing. And, and more importantly, you've been, you know, the, you've been in this space running this company pre COVID you've done it now in the post COVID era. Right. So tell us a little bit about how have you seen the policies of Amazon change over time over the last few years and maybe touch a little bit upon pre COVID and now post COVID if you've seen any major change. Well, I mean, the policies are getting stricter. I think everyone can agree on that. Enforcement is getting tighter. I think most people can agree on that. There isn't much lax enforcement unless you're talking about reporting somebody for reviews, abuse or brand abuse. There is some lax enforcement there, but Amazon's making some strides in terms of uh, competitor abuse and, and enforcement of, you know, against bad behavior, bad actors. But in terms of what you can list, how you can list it, what you can sell, how you sell it, how you portray your brand or um, obedience to listing compliance rules, all of that's tightened up over the COVID era and post, if we can call this kind of the semi post COVID era. Heading into 2022, I just see more enforcement, which means bottom line, every brand, every seller has to have every, have, has to manage their account well, has to have everything in order and has to run a tight ship because the more things are either outsourced to companies that may or may not know what they're doing, or even internally to your own employees, people that are learning on the fly or guessing on things, whether it's guessing on their interpretation of a policy or guessing on how things can be properly executed, uh, take the guesswork out because your margin for error is much, much narrower now. Amazon comes under a lot of scrutiny for things that exist live on the site, live in the marketplace that should not exist or, or appear the way they are. Um, Government bodies, media, whoever it is, critics are constantly barraging Amazon with these complaints about why can't you develop a tool that does this? Why can't you fix that? Why are these things coming up over and over again? Amazon's getting a lot of heat for this stuff. So it motivates them to be extremely stringent and to come up with much more, um, you know, much more punishing algorithms, let's say, to resolve these things before they become headaches. Right. And what do you think is driving some of this? Is it all the scrutiny that you talked about as opposed to, you know, maybe just some internal partner obsession or customer obsession that they need to show? Where do you think the, the line is being drawn here? Like, is it just this pressure that they're getting externally because of which they're tightening things up or there's some other forces that are in play here? Yeah, if if they want to provide the best buyer experience, if they're so customer obsessed, then they have to be this strict. And they have to limit a seller's ability to sell certain things or do certain things if they think there's a risk there to the consumer or the buyer. So that is in line with Amazon's, you know, prime directive, number one mandate. But beyond that, we also just know the climate they're operating in, which is con continuing and I would say increasing scrutiny from media, depending on the topic. Definitely, we can all agree there's increasing scrutiny from regulatory and governmental bodies and agencies, which wasn't necessarily uh, so attentive or so present before the last year or so. So those two things combined together on top of Amazon learning from their own experiences, some of which are bad or negative experiences from missing things in the past. Those two or three things combined together make for a marketplace where sellers really have to thread a needle and get it, get it right the first time, I guess is the best way to put it. I know it's kind of tough to get everything right the first time. It's not easy to be a seller anyway, even without Amazon's enforcement. And then on top of that, Amazon sometimes has haphazard, inconsistent enforcement, whether it's 
the manual investigations my former teams do or try to do, or even the bots or the algorithms they put into place sometimes are flawed and create a lot of false positives. So the additional hurdle is understanding that Amazon might make a mistake that you have to do some additional work to correct. I think that's where sellers are falling short currently. They they want to just blame Amazon for things they don't understand, at least because of the dynamics of the power relationship, <laughs> they might have to make up some time and do some of the work that Amazon should have done the first time. Right, and do you see, how do you see this play out in the future? Do you think Amazon is, continue, is going to continue to invest in, in perfecting the system, or we're always going to be living in this world where, look, Amazon's gonna do their best, but we've got to take control on our own. What do you think, where do you think the balance will lie in the future? It'll be the second, the second option. Um, Amazon will do what they can do. Uh, this is, this is hard to scale some of this work that we see them doing with the consulting I do. Um, there will be false positives. There will be mistakes. You're going to have to watch them while they're watching you for a while. You're going to have to keep an eye on, are they doing the right thing? Are they making mistakes? And also, how do you correct their mistakes? That sounds like a joke. That sounds kind of laughable, but it's true. You're going to have to keep an eye on whether they're doing things effectively. And when they don't, you're, you might have to mop up after them a little bit because they are a work in progress, but they also don't have the same incentive that you do. They don't have the same incentive to communicate with you as you do with them. And I think communication is a lot of what this is about. And it's a lot of the frustrations that Amazon sellers have dealing with seller performance, policy enforcement teams, catalog teams, uh, product compliance teams, whoever they might have to deal with. You have to understand that Amazon wants to communicate with you very quickly in a very generic template copy and paste style because they don't want to customize much. It's hard to scale that and it's time consuming. So when they're refusing to communicate well with you, you have to make twice as sure that you're communicating effectively back with them. And unfortunately, what we see as consultants is a lot of times sellers are not communicating in the best ways with Amazon and they're not locking down their side. They're focused on what Amazon is screwing up and they're not thinking as much about what they might be messing up. And it's like if you've got 100 percent of your side in order and it's all Amazon botching it, then that's fine. You can escalate that. But if, the, if it's a situation where you, you and Amazon are kind of talking past each other and in the zone in between is where this can be solved and remedied, then it's sort of fault is shared by both sides. And that's not where you want to hang out. Absolutely. Yeah. And do you think this problem that we're seeing with Amazon or this dichotomy between sellers and Amazon extends to other marketplaces as well? Are you seeing the same problem? I guess the volume on these other marketplaces is a lot lower for a seller, but lower. by and large, are you seeing any of these issues prop up in other marketplaces? Well, let's use walmart.com as an example because I do have some clients that sell on Walmart. They might sell 91% Amazon, 9% Walmart, something like that. In theory, that those numbers could change. They might sell more on, on Walmart over time. Uh, but I hear mixed reviews, I guess you'd call it, of Walmart's communication. Some people tell me they communicate way better than Amazon. Other people tell me it's the same. And then some people say it's worse. The, the functionality of the Walmart platform is where I hear the most criticism. That Walmart should have and could have invested. We, we know they could have. They've got billions and billions of dollars that they could invest in resources to improve their, their platform functionality. But it sounds like they haven't. Um, I'm not so much of a Walmart platform expert, but I just hear that dealing with Walmart's platform functionality is the biggest pain point. And so I don't know if Walmart's going to start catching up with Amazon until platform functionality is better, um, until there's more selling, more customers buying on Walmart.com, of course. And then on top of that, if there's Amazon sellers don't think Amazon, uh, I'm sorry, if they don't believe Walmart's communication has improved enough over Amazon's, then they might still retreat to selling more on Amazon. Um, some of the other platforms I don't deal with or hear about so much, but I do hear about Walmart. And I think Walmart just has some some additional years of improvement to look to look at first. Right. You know, I've yeah. always wondered whether someone launching a new marketplace is, I believe a marketplace, I believe Michael's, if I'm not mistaken, just announced mm -hmm. something around they're launching a new marketplace. So how much should some large player like a Michael's who's going to launch a marketplace think about these issues, even though it may not be a problem today? 
uh, and should they be investing in in policing and, and the right tooling today as opposed to think about it a problem after it becomes a problem what are your opinions there how much proactivity versus let's be reactive later it's interesting because it reminds me of um, the first company that I worked with after Amazon was Instacart. And mm. it was for a very, it was only for like a summer. It was for a very brief time. But I started, when they were starting from scratch, I started looking at how they handled fraud. You know, I, I thought about maybe helping them with fraud prevention teams. But first I had to understand how the operation worked. And I realized that Instacart and Amazon and a lot of these e-commerce companies, they wait until there's a problem and then they address it. They react. Right. And I thought it was interesting that Instacart, which is thriving and doing extremely well right now, they were doing extremely well pre-COVID actually. They're doing even better now in terms of valuation. Um, they didn't really anticipate something that we all know exists like credit card fraud or um, kind of smash and grab bait and switch tactics by customers. <laughs> um, Anyone, anyone at the beginning of Instacart could have anticipated that people would try to game the system and commit fraud, but they didn't really have any tools or teams set up for it, which is, I guess, one reason I was interested in their operations in the first place. But it's funny how they really just go where the squeaky wheel is to add the grease there, and they kind of want to keep the lights on and just keep, keep the wheels spinning, and they don't spend a lot of time and effort and energy anticipating problems that are even easy to anticipate like fraud. So that's one experience that I thought was interesting. And just a side note, all the years I was working at Amazon, I never heard from anyone at Walmart or walmart.com who was trying to poach me or poach my team or my people or the colleagues and coworkers I had at Amazon. Maybe they got messages and didn't tell me about it, but I don't remember anyone ever bringing up like 2011, 2012 or 2013. Those were the years, which is like eight, nine years ago. Uh, that Walmart could have gotten ahead of it. You know what I mean? Right. They seemed like, I mean, I think we can all agree they're at least a little bit behind the curve on some of these things. Amazon was definitely playing catch up, but Amazon got an earlier start because they were managing and opening a marketplace way earlier in the 2000s. Right. Um, so it's kind of amazing to me that some of the startups now, people starting marketplaces now, haven't learned from the Amazon mistakes and anticipated some of the kinds of problems you have with marketplaces, whether it's competitors trying to knock each other off or even buyer on seller fraud, like returns. We all know about returns abuse, right? People buy an expensive item and then they return it. You know, they buy a, a high, a high price electronics item and then they return an electronics item <laughs> that was like 10 or 12 years old, you know? Yeah. And so. do you, do you think anyone is doing it right? or is being more proactive about it? Is there any marketplace, any platform that you know of that, hey, maybe we should be mimicking them or anyone new should be thinking about them or there's no one out there who's being proactive about it? I mean, I think the, well, there's no one that pops into my mind that's been proactive since the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think Amazon is the most proactive about it because they've learned by doing for so long. Right. And they've, they've, they've learned, which is fine to learn by doing in the early stages of a marketplace, you'd, you'd be more concerned if they were learning by doing now versus then. For fraud prevention, they've seen a lot of fraud, they've prevented a lot of fraud, and they've done that for a decade and a half back to the early days of my time there. What worries me about Amazon is that they're learning by doing with things like product safety and product compliance only from the 2019, 2020. You know, that's, that was late to start some of this enforcement. Um, now they're better, but it's, it seems to be that certain, certain kinks that you have to iron out take 18 months to 24 months of, of experience to do. So some of it, Amazon's already ahead of every, every other marketplace because they've been doing it longer, but then there are other new kinds of fraud or, you know, like I said, product safety, product compliance initiatives, maybe the EPA or the FDA comes out with some new initiatives and all marketplaces are equal because they're all trying to address those concerns as soon as those announcements hit. Um, so, right. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. And, and then Chris, recently, I'm sure you heard the news around Amazon banning about 600 sellers that were based in China. Do you see, yep you see more of that happening in the future? Do you think there's going to be more cleanup efforts like this from Amazon, more bulk sort of efforts, or it's going to be more continuous and gradual? What's your opinion? 
Yeah, and just a side note, um, banning Chinese sellers or things that relate to fraud that in, that come out of China, initiated in China, those are always the big stories, right? If it's Chinese sellers, because there's so many Chinese sellers on Amazon.com or in UK or EU for Amazon. I hasten to add that numerous US and, and Europe and UK based sellers were busted for the same stuff. Mainly we're talking about brand abuse, reviews abuse, uh, so-called code of conduct violations. So I understand that a lot of ink was spilled on the 600 Chinese accounts or Chinese sellers that they said operated maybe up to 6,000 accounts total. Um, but less media scrutiny uh, fell on the US based sellers who were suspended for the same practices. <laughs> um, there will be more of that because Amazon's being pushed and pressured to document that they are punishing sellers for bad behavior. So the best way to do that is to suspend accounts. Um, it's interesting that a lot of the sellers in China that I've heard about, not necessarily worked with, I don't have that many Chinese clients at all, uh, they aren't interested or weren't interested in following the rules in the first place. So they were just waiting for Amazon to take them down and Amazon wasn't doing it for years. So that was really just a correction for past misses and gaps in Amazon processes. Because when it came to abusing the multiple account policy, abusing the reviews abuse uh, policies, brand abuse, whatever, they were doing that, the ones that were banned were doing that the whole way. So they were just waiting to get taken down. They never had any intention of following the policy. Um, I think in the future, everyone's on notice that if you don't have any intention of following policies, you cannot expect a slap on the wrist, an easy appeal, an easy reinstatement. Um, and I've talked to too many sellers and brands who just expected to harvest as many, you know, bogus positive reviews as possible. And then, oh, as soon as Amazon cracks down and gets serious, then we'll stop it. Then we'll knock it off. That's not how it works. A lot of these people are still out there suspended trying to appeal it. So the mentality of the Amazon seller has, has changed rapidly and it had to. Um, the other thing I see, especially in Q4, is people don't appeal um, smartly and, and quickly enough. Sellers know how, to, know how to appeal quickly when a listing's taken down. They don't know how to appeal quickly and in a smart way. That's where most brands we work with are still behind the curve. They have to understand, A, Amazon doesn't respond right away. Uh, B, if you appeal today and you do it in a haphazard fashion, they might respond right away, but they'll reject it or they'll ignore it, and you're just digging a deeper hole, right? So you have to be quick, but you have to be smart about it. And that's where we see brands kind of not understanding the inner workings of Amazon in Amazon communications these days. Right. So that makes sense. And I have one final question for you, Chris, is mm -hmm. what would your recommendation be for a brand? Should they be building this capability in-house? Should they be working with a player like, like your company? What would be the best way for a brand to have this part of their operations on a regular basis? Yeah, and you can you can freely build your own teams. Just make sure that they're high performance and they don't make a lot of mistakes. Not every seller or brand that we talk to hires us for all the hands-on nitty-gritty work. Some of them just show us what their teams are doing and they want to talk about SOP improvements, process improvements, um, booking our time for anywhere to one project to just one hour of an initial consult. And we have that range of services for that reason. Some, some brands, some companies really want to do this themselves. And as long as they can do it at a high level and competently, we encourage them to do that too, not necessarily to hire us every time. Um, but make sure your quality control is robust. Make sure your due diligence is extraordinarily um, detailed and, and competent because you can't just say, well, we've got a free employee who's got half a day free every day. We're going to have them manage our Amazon account and read up all these policy pages and just assume that your in-house employee will understand and interpret those policies correctly. They might need help with that. Um, other companies don't delegate to a lower level in-house employee. They say, our Amazon business is too important. It's our biggest revenue driver. So we're going to have our CEO involved on every decision, or we're going to have our CTO, CFO, whoever, COO involved on every single decision. But that might not be the person who has the highest breadth of Amazon knowledge. So you need to go with the people who can communicate the best 
as in communicate the way Amazon needs them to communicate, but also understands Amazon strategy. Um, some people know that from doing it themselves and they just need to fine tune a couple of, as I've said, gaps or, or, or mistakes in their processes. And they, they jump, they jump on calls with us to help understand strategy. Other people kick it to us and say, we need you to manage our strategy on the appeals process because we've tried it a couple of times. We're not doing so well at it, or we do eventually successfully appeal and get listings reinstated but we lose, you know, 3,000 a day or 10,000 a day. Uh, you know, we work with seven figure sellers, eight figure sellers, a few nine figure sellers. Some of them can't afford to be waiting for an appeal to be read by Amazon. And they can't afford to guess at how to escalate appeals within Amazon because they're losing so many thousands of dollars a day that that listing's down. So we encourage them to do it themselves if they know what they're doing. And Chris, for the yeah. sellers, and brands who are listening to our show right now, what would be the best way for them to get in, talk, in touch with you if they, if they would like to you know, contact you for some of this work? Sure. Um, and if they have any questions, of course, about the Seller Velocity Conference for 2022, we're already working on that. Uh, SellerVelocityConference.com is the best uh, resource for that. But ecommercechris.com, we have a contact form. You can send me an email, chris at ecommercechris. Dot com. Uh, we know the time is of the essence in Q4. I'm really good about my inbox, but of course, during Q4, sometimes we get two, 300 emails into my inbox a day. Uh, so you can always feel free to follow up with our contact form if I don't personally respond to you right away. If you come to me through Canal and his podcast, of course, my eyes will be on it quicker and I'll respond faster. <laughs> Fantastic. Put Canal's name in the subject line. There you yeah. go. There you go. That's the way to do it. Yeah, and I'd encourage everyone listening, you know, Q4 is just around the corner. We don't have a lot of time. So if there's an opportunity to go contact Chris, this is the time to do it. Like, this is probably yeah. our last opportunity to get going for Q4. So I hope mm -hmm. everyone will take you up on that, Chris. But Chris, thank yeah. you so much. I appreciate the time that you've given us today to walk through your background, but also just talk to us about the landscape and how you see it evolving. Appreciate your time. We hope to have you back on another version of this, but uh, thank you again. And we will see you again, hopefully in another episode of Master the Marketplace. Thank you again, everyone for joining thank us you. today. Have a great day. Through conversations with experts in online retail, with years of marketing, compliance, and inventory management experience, we seek to empower our listeners to master the marketplace. Thanks for listening. We hope to see you next time on Master the Marketplace with Caspian.